Hi everyone, I'm Alexei Dingli. I'm a professor of artificial intelligence at the University of Malta. And today I'll be chairing this panel, uh, which deals with where is AI del delivering data and where is, whether it is time to call it a day in the clinical domain. So let me start by introducing the panelists. Um, so first of all, Dr. Jejegat. Um, okay, they're coming in. <laughs> I'll introduce them after. So we we'll start on my left, um, Mich Dr. Michel Bielecki. Yes? Okay. <laughs> um, he's the C uh, CEO and co-founder of Testacy. Um, Dr. Jejegat, uh, CEO of Ebo. Um, Fru Fruzina Mazei, health economist at Samuel Samuelweiss University and digital health lead at Medistone. And finally, but not least, Nishar Gonigar, who is the co-founder of Bolo. Okay, so let's start with a first round of introductions. So I'll ask each and every one of you to introduce yourself and a little bit what you do, especially within the medical domain. Would you like to start, Michel? Sure thing, thanks a lot. So hi everyone, my name is Michel Bielecki. I did my MD at the University of Zurich. I'm currently pursuing an MPH at Harvard Chan. And I've been mostly working in public health and epidemiology for the past five years, amongst others for the Swiss Armed Forces, uh, the NATO with a focus on the Balkans, and uh, later in infectious diseases. And since last year, I co-founded Testazy, um, a startup that focuses on at-home lab testing, uh, together with Jayla, who's also in the audience here. OK, thank you very much. Um, Jeje? Thank you, Alexei. Good morning, all. My name is Jeje Gatt. Um, together with Alexei, I represent the Maltese contingent on this panel. Um, I'm the CEO of a London-based AI company, which is called uh, Ebo. Uh, we focus on uh, patient engagement, and I think we work at that touch point where we see some of the most underpaid and overworked professionals in public health. And what we seek to do is give them back capacity by reducing some of the administrative workload which is associated with very common patient pathways. And for us, one of the key benefits that we look at, uh, Alexei, is this correlation between empowering patients to take control of their healthcare agenda, which in turn leads to better clinical outcomes. And that is a social good, and that is a key correlation between effective technology and healthier societies. Thank you, Jeje. What about you, Fuzin? Hi, everyone. My name is Fuzina Mazei. I'm based in Budapest, Hungary. And as of my background, I am a health economist. I focus on health technology assessment of digital health solutions. And I'm very much an advocate of evidence-based medicine and evidence-based implementation of digital health solutions into care pathways. I think it's very important to mention that, um, that uh, there are lots of digital health solutions out there with um, some with AI components, some without. However, it's, it's essential that we assess these digital health solutions before implementing these into the care pathways. Otherwise, we might make the mistake that we implement the a less efficient, a less effective solution into a care pathway that we, that we, um, that we, and that we miss a better one. Thank you, Nishargo. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to be here. I am Nishargo Nigar, and I co-founded Bolo, which is a mental health-based AI startup with Heidi, who's recording right from there. <laughs> and uh, we are from Germany. We live there. And I'm also an international student studying MSc in Information and Communication Systems at Hamburg University of Technology. And I also work part-time as an IT project manager at Drum Solutions. I like to call myself a student entrepreneur and uh, mental health care is something very close to me. That's what we are trying to achieve so that we can help people to express and manage their emotions. Thank you very much. So let's start with the first round of questions. Um, I'll start with you, Jeje. Um, so, you know, at the moment, AI is uh, pretty much the, the most um, important technology. At least it's being mentioned in practically um, anywhere, anywhere you look. So, in your opinion, ultimately, uh, what, what kind of problems is AI trying to solve, or at least managing to solve in the healthcare? I tell most of my students at the University of Malta that the role of education 
is to help us think about interesting problems that we can solve. And I think Ebo is blessed with the opportunity to solve two of the largest public healthcare problems that plague our society today. The first problem, Alexei, is access. So Eurostat research shows us that about 52% of all European citizens do not have the level of digital literacy skills to allow them to interact with the overly digitized, overly bureaucratized healthcare platform systems. And this is a problem. You cannot marginalize half your society and push them out of what is ultimately a public good. So what Ebo does, the first problem we solve, is trying to lower the bar of engagement to allow any citizens, whatever their digital maturity and skills, to effectively interact with healthcare. And I think Frizina said something which is key in her introduction, which is when measuring the system, it is not about effectiveness, it's about impact. And that's what we seek to do. We try to relook at society in which public healthcare could be more impactful. The second problem that AI solves and that we focus on in this area is capacity. A really interesting study by the World Health Organization shows that by the end of our decade, we will have 10 million less clinicians than we need to sustain basic healthcare services. Now, this is a problem, and universities cannot solve it in short term. And we believe that this is the role that AI can play in healthcare today. We need to restore capacity back to our overworked clinicians. And artificial intelligence can do that through the blessing of automation to take out robotic, administrative, repetitive, non-value creating activities in pathways and move them out of the healthcare uh, process which is burdened on clinicians. So giving them back time to do what they've studied, what they can do best. So I think tackling access and demand are the two areas that AI focuses on. And in our case, the empowering tool is restoring patient agency. Because when you empower the patient, when you give agency back to the patient, in turn, this does lead to better clinical outcomes. Thank you, Jeje. So, Frusina, and continuing on what JJ was saying, um, you know, with AI, the sky is the limit, really. So, how do, I, do you identify the best solution, which are which are both good for the patient, but also for for the healthcare system? I think this is, um, first of all, a, a difficult and complex question that I uh, don't have the answer to. However, several organisations across Europe and globally are trying to identify those solutions that actually have value to the healthcare system. So there are, as I said, several digital health solutions with AI components on the market currently, and there are several uh, solutions that are being developed as we speak. They are developed by, uh, by large multinational organizations, by research teams at universities and um, startups as well. So as a user or even as a healthcare professional or, or as a buyer, for example, in a hospital, how do you actually identify those that have added value, that have clinical benefit or not even clinical but organizational benefit? I think this is the point where, where buyers and decision makers usually turn to health technology assessment. And as a health economist, I find it really important to use uh, health technology assessment also in case of implementing digital health solutions and AI. However, uh, and I like to say this, it is not as easy with digital health solutions as with, with uh, classical pharmaceutical products or medical devices because these um, AI solutions or digital health technologies, they change. So with, with every update, they, they, they change to some extent. And their, their, their impact, their, their, the health gain that they bring to the patient or the organizational benefit that they bring to a hospital, it changes, it might change with every update. So it's, it's really difficult to evaluate them. And um, 
because of this, several uh, European organizations, uh, NICE, for example, very recently, in August 2022, they have, they have um, published an updated guideline uh, on evidence standards for AI solutions. So has the FDA. Start, they started to think about how, in what way, could we evaluate something that's, that's constantly changing? Because with AI, you have to update update the, the the software you have to update the solution so it's it's very difficult to actually grasp how these solutions benefit the healthcare system however these these regulatory agencies are trying and there are several very valuable uh, evidence frameworks already out there uh, that that uh, should be looked at if you're interested in how to evaluate these Yes, you're right. So, you know, with AI, things are constantly changing. The software is constantly changing. But also in the medical domain, we tend to find a lot of applications working within the same, within, within the same area. So, so, Michelle, what about the integration of these different solutions together? What's your opinion? Um, that's a good question. I'd like to speak a bit about Switzerland in this context. Because what I think is interesting is that we have a bit of a graveyard of AI solutions. So you have scientists that sometimes even together with clinicians come up with some models, but um, after publishing, it often stops there and, and it never gets really further validated. And so I think Switzerland is an excellent um, uh, example for that because we just opened one of the largest AI centers in the world at the Federal Institute of Technology where 88 departments were formed for different subdivisions of artificial intelligence um, and we have one of the most modern clinics, University Hospital Zurich and there is absolutely no implementation of AI solutions there. So there is, there is no framework that allows this technology transfer from the lab into clinical work. And if you look, um, the, the other polar example is um, in Boston, uh, where you have the Brigham and Women's Hospital that actively pushes for implementation of research projects into everyday clinical work, or at least into validation of those solutions. Okay, thank you. So, Nishargo, since we, we've just heard, you know, about this, this graveyard of AI solutions, um, what, what, what's, what, what should we do about it? I mean, should we maybe limit the usage of AI and the health tech? I think it depends on the usage. Like Rosina said, I think uh, AI has become such a buzzword that entrepreneurs and uh, healthcare industry is, are so interested to implement that, but is it really working? The question is, are the customers being benefited as much as they should have been? That's the question. We entrepreneurs should really assess that and go through a thorough process where we know that it's actually working and we are not just using for the sake of it, that it has become a buzzword, so we have to use it because it's so trendy and interesting and cool. So maybe it's great to attract investors, but it shouldn't be like that. You should actually care about the customers and if it's really helpful for them and if it's actually benefiting the healthcare industry. That's what I believe. Okay, thank you. So, you know, since we're here, probably we're very much into um, pro for the tech and industry now. So, so JJ, in, in your opinion, what are the drivers or maybe the blockers no, that is um, uh, holding us back from uh, reaching the patient and giving this technology to, to people? Uh, let's speak about the elephant in the room, right? Um, in general terms, most patients do not trust artificial intelligence. And to move towards a trust-based society in technology, you cannot merely improve the technology itself, which we're doing with AI, but we need to radically rethink the concept of patient information. So I think the problem which we have here in adoption, one of the biggest blockers, is in fact the aggrandization of claims about what AI can actually achieve. And I think there was a perfect example with uh, IBM Watson's claims about oncology, which then were the subject of several uh, lawsuits. So in order to ensure that patients trust an AI innovation which is implemented in a hospital, we need to take time and patiently explain 
the benefits of AI to our patients. Technology moves fast, but the cognition of patients does not, right? So when lives and treatment outcomes are at risk, it is imperative that we ensure transparency, both from technology providers and from healthcare providers. So I think this brings us to this whole new discussion about AI literacy. We need to take time to explain AI concepts to the entire industry. Concepts like classification, concepts like confidence levels, the difficult discussions around ethics, fairness in machine learning, bias, and we have to do that for non-technical audiences. And one of my concerns, which emerges from a lot of public policy marketing in European countries, is that the hype which is created around AI in healthcare, subsequently hides the tough questions that we need to ask. And it is through these tough questions that you could build trust in, an, in a way which is open. And perhaps this openness, this principle of openness in AI, brings us to four key elements that we need to ensure occur in every technology implementation. Firstly, that the technology is lawful it's the basis of operation. But without that, if there isn't respect for the key laws of the country, whether that relates to privacy or other laws, then that's a blocker. The second one is ethics. Ethics is tricky because it is often not codified and it has jurisdictional variations depending on which country uh, or continent you're in. But the ethical matching of the solution to the expectations of society Thirdly, the robustness of the solution. Is it available? Is it repeatable? Does it give outcomes which uh, can be maintained and sustained over time? And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, Alexei, an area which I know you worked on a lot personally, is the explainability concept. If we have black boxed AI solutions in healthcare, patients will never relate to them because they can't understand how that outcome has been reached. So I think if we frame the blocker to adoption as being the aggrandization of health, of, of claims, the antidote to that are these four principles, right? Creating trust through lawful AI, through ethical AI, through robust AI, and explainable AI. If we have that in place, I think we've got the right ingredients for adoption. Thank you, Jaja. Definitely agree with, the, with that. Um, Nishargo, what about um, unhelpful AI? Because so far we've spoken about, you know, that AI that's there to support us. But is there an AI which is unhelpful to people? Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, we try to use technology to our benefit, but it's not always the same case. Right now, everything is almost being uh, replaced, but you can't replace everything at the same time, like uh, mental health. We can't replace psychiatrists just like that. And AI can listen to you, of course. There are chatbots, AI apps, but maybe it can listen to me, it can hear me, but um, there are people who definitely want to be heard and seen and be validated by real human connection, which I feel is appropriated by real people who are experts in this domain mental health care experts, and not just AI or chatbots. Thank you. Um, Michelle, if we were to look under the hood, can you give some tangible examples of integration issues, maybe some, some poor um, projects which, which didn't work out? Yeah, I would like to second here what George said um, just a minute ago. I think the fundament, one of the fundamental issues is um, lack of awareness also amongst clinicians. I feel like we have two camps right now. Camp number one are the skeptics who don't want to do anything with AI and just think that AI will replace them because they don't even understand how it works. And camp number two is those who think that AI is a magic bullet and they think that um, you should just use it everywhere. And the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. And like with every implementation, 
I think especially in healthcare where patients' lives matter, it requires a rigid methodology and also appropriate frameworks for the rollout of technologies. And just last year, I think it was, um, a US company um, called Epic, which has an electronic healthcare record system, um, introduced a new module for early sepsis detection. And uh, essentially they wanted to roll it out fast and they sold it to hundreds of hospitals across all the US. And one year later, they noticed that the model was comp so they didn't disclose how the um, how the machine learning algorithm works exactly, and that was an issue later on because it turned out that the model missed two thirds of patients who actually developed sepsis, and uh, it was biased and it was not generali generalizable towards the whole population. And just like in basic statistics, any any model you build up needs to be generalizable or it's useless. So we need and we require solid frameworks to test this and validate those models. Thank you, um, Frusina. So we've heard about a lot of these challenges. Um, so what can we do um, to ensure that you know AI really does touch people, re re really um, is inserted in everyday care and at a large scale as well? I think in addition to assess whether an AI is actually, uh, it, whether it brings value in that uh, given environment, it is also essential to educate not just patients, as you said, George, but also healthcare professionals. Because if the regulatory background is there and the AI is not being used or, or it's not being used as purposed or is not understood by the patient, uh, it's, just, it's just its effectiveness will, will decline. So, um, so I would I would even take it one step further. What you said, George, that uh, the, the the healthcare professional needs to educate the patients and needs to needs to inform them about about uh, about what what an AI is capable of. I think even healthcare professionals and the entire healthcare system needs to be educated. And uh, just uh, with a show of hands from the audience, who is uh, familiar with the German DIGA? Okay, so not that many, but uh, but at least a couple of you. So uh, the German German set a regulatory background to uh, reimburse digital health applications. They have uh, they can like doctors, healthcare professionals can now prescribe digital health apps to their patients, and there are about 34, 35 applications that, as of this moment, can be prescribed to patients. And um, so, so about seven million insured, uh, 70 million insured people now have access to these applications, but only about one percent of the apps was actually prescribed in the uh, year and a half that this regulation in, is in place. And why is that? It is because the system, while setting a regulatory background, it failed to actually educate healthcare professionals on why these apps are useful. And, and healthcare professionals, then of course, why would they prescribe it if they don't know what's the value in them? Why would patients use it if they don't know what's the value in it? So I think in addition to assessing whether whether an AI in a given setting is actually, whether it, it brings uh, a clinical or an organizational benefit. We need to start educating people. We need to start allocating resources to, to teach and educate people about why, why AI is, is good. Thank you very much. So we're running a little bit out of time, so we have to conclude. Um, uh, let me finish with a very quick round, a final question. So we've been invited again to MedTech 2032, okay, in 10 years' time. Um, so what, what are we talking about? What's the situation of, of the medical um, tech uh, in, in 10 years' time? What are your views? Would you like to start, Michel? You're putting me on the spot here. I, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's a good question. I, I, I think... Um, I, 
I think we'll be probably looking back at all the disasters that happened after implementing lots of those uh, frameworks and we will be reviewing what we could do better because right now we're in a wild west of AI where things get implemented left and right without any consideration for what the consequences might be. And I think that uh, it's gonna take one or two decades until we have appropriate um, frameworks for that. Thank you. Nishargo? Hmm. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it really depends on the situation. Everything will be very advanced, I hope. Um, there are more educated people who really understand the value of it and utilize it properly and more human lives are saved for the sake of humanity. Everything becomes normalized, not, people are not scared of AI anymore, like it will be Skynet or something. Yeah, that's what I want to see. Okay, Frozina? Well, I'm, I'm very much hoping for a value-based value -based, uh, healthcare and uh, I'm hoping to reach that by health technology assessment and uh, education combined. And I'm hoping for a value-based uh, healthcare systems globally where uh, AI is implemented, where, where it brings benefit and AI is not implemented where it doesn't, where, uh, where different interventions that have clinical benefit are implemented, but those that don't and just have good marketing, they are not implemented. Thank you. JJ, last few seconds. Uh, what does success look like, right? The most important question. I think in a decade from now, success looks like three factors to me. The first is that we will have a society with digital inclusion, where we would have lowered the engagement bar for the general public to interact with healthcare services. The second pillar of success for me is health equity which is granting to society, regardless of their level of skill, regardless to their level of capability access or any other disparities, full and free access to public health care. And the third pillar of success, what good looks like to me in a decade from now, is patient centricity, is building an entire suite of tools and services and clinical pathways which end to end have the patient and not the system at their core center. That's what good looks like in 2033. Thank you very much. That was all. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa. Thank you.